what we got here. Harley Benton JA60, I think it's called. And you guessed it, it's a, a right hander, no, left hander. And it's another of Rich's guitars. Um, this one has a straightforward arrangement, so it's got a, a tunematic bridge, style bridge, with a stop bar. Um, making it kind of easy easy to work with really and I guess it has a widening neck heel so it's an angle in the an angle cut into the neck heel to give it a bit of a lift to get that bridge um, we've got a basswood body quite a nice looking maple neck with a blackwood fingerboard on it um, bound neck on the edges two Roswell P90s uh, and that simple really kind of a short range short distance so, um, sunburst a tortoise shell thingy this one's in good condition this is straight out of the box from Toman um, good condition the only downside about this is that the frets are sharp um, noticeably sharp on the edges you can cut yourself on those. Um, these need, well, these do need some work. So I would typically, let's see my magic. Look at that, what a great device. Um, yeah, I can really feel that edge is on here. There's a lot of overhang here. So you can either do these things kind of individually really or you can do them try and do them all in one go with a sanding block. Individual is quite satisfying if you've got the time um, but you can really feel how much metal metal has to come off here to flatten these out. You can sort of roll them with the edges a little bit. Um, oh yeah, they really are sharp. Still. It's not a major big deal. You can probably find some sort of file that will do this, even if you haven't got technically a fret, a fret file like this. Um, you can, alternatively, you can do that with some sandpaper going down the edge, but um, it's kind of, I don't know. I like, I prefer to do the sandpapering to polish the edges just to get them nice and shiny. I'd rather not try and take down as much excess metal um, it's kind of feels more controllable doing it like this you can you can really hear the amount of metal it's taking off of course you also have to be careful it's quite easy to cut into the uh, binding oh, yeah blimey probably Hear it grinding? That's the, that's the amount of overhang on that fret. Wow. Um, it probably, just as well, you'd probably want to take the neck off to do this. Get access, easier access right up to these top frets. Um, Let me just go down the end here while I'm at it now, since I've, I've started. These are these are a little bit less overhangy down this end. most of them kind of action with this thumb really the other hand kind of controls it really there we go so can I get any further up here and get to this one and they really are sticking out quite some distance here. <laughs> I 
Now once I've polished or filed off this excess material then we also want to be sure to um, level that or uh, smooth that off when we come to the uh, polishing out process in, in, in the case of doing some fret leveling. Um, so this is a sort of cruder thing and then sort of fine tune it with sandpaper a bit later. Actually this side isn't quite as bad as the top edge. And this is the playing edge you'd really feel it. Um, Yeah, it's, it's, um, it can be quite severe on some budget guitars. As you can see, it takes a little while to even just take off the, the you know, the obvious burr or the obvious sharp edge. So time equals money in the factory, I guess. There we go. That was just a quick start up. It's one of those things you might as well get the bulk of it done now. Um, I can't, it's quite, quite sticking out here as well. Yeah, so you get the get the bulk of it done now before we go any further. Boing. So this is where you'll really feel it up here when you come to play a lead break and you're wrapping your hand right the way around. Okay, I can't quite get as far into this one as there as the others, but there we go. Right, I'm we'll tidy up the soften it up a bit later on. So the first thing I want to do is plug her in just briefly and give you an example of how these Roswell pickups sound, although obviously not played particularly cleverly. Left handed. They're not bad. They're sort of supposedly an, an improvement on the um, Wilkinson brand. Hey, remembered. Got the thing plugged in. Yeah, an improvement on the Wilkinson brand um, pickup. So, don't know why they're, why they're called Roswell. I don't know anything about the story behind that, but anyway, 
Roswell by name. Roswell by... It's not Area 51, is it? Um, no conspiracy. Alien conspiracy theories. Anyway, okay, so we've got a new guitar shop for ends, needing some work. We've got what looks like could be a bone nut here or some tusky thing, um, which is good. We'll leave that in if possible, as long as it works. I haven't really heard any issues tune, um, tuning it so far, like it's not sticking, but the action is fairly high off there. Um, we've also, it's reasonably high all over, but we'll have a quick, quick look at what we start out with. So, well, yeah, okay. We've got over two millimeters on the low E, and I'd say 2.2 and 2.25, something like that, two, I'll call it. 2.1 and 2.25, low E, last fret, high E, last fret. Now, it looks to me like quite a flat radius, but it does look miles high. So we can adjust that and the good thing is that it's a tunematic bridge so well tunematic style so this thing should adjust down straight e straight away nice and easily wow it's high up actually oh, it's stiff as well we'll see what we see when it how, how see how the frets play in a minute Let's see what we can get it to well wow, it's incredibly stiff On the one millimeter, that's incredibly low. That's 1.5. So nice and low, but with a flattish radius. Um, I can't remember what it said about radius, if anything. The uh, spec says this comes with tens as standard, and it's a, it's a 648 scale. I guarantee you, this one will be a problem. At least on the bass side anyway. A little bit better on the treble. Yeah, again, quite a lot of snazzling in the bass side, but not so much on the treble, which is good. Um, and we have, let's have a look at what we got in terms of relief. First and last fret, well, a very small amount. Again, about it's actually a little bit more on the treble side, so but under but around about 0.1 of a, a millimeter, so very very small amount of neck relief. But no reason why we should continue like that. So I'm going to get straight on into this with the usual first fret action um, adjustment and widening of slots. So. We'll, um, we'll do it from this way out or out or in or um, these butterfly string trees ugh, they're kind of so mechanical so brutal wish I could live without them okay so we've got a point three of a millimeter twenty 
24, 16, get these the right way around, sunshine. Okay. Okay, so this will be old news to Rich. Yeah, this is tusk, or well, new bone, I should say. It's got that sort of crumbly cheese feel to it, which is a bit weird, really, but that's what it feels like to me. Um, yeah, so that, okay, if you haven't seen this before, what I'm doing here is I'm setting the first fret, first fret action nice and low and the reason for that is because the guitar actually likes to play best pretty much there it, it, it plays best with a very low first fret action most factories set it really high not deliberately it's a sort of default thing they have a kind of basic nut that they manufacture in, in bulk and they have a, a slot cut in the top of the guitar and they put the two together and that's a lot the way it goes and obviously it can vary depending on manufacturing and you know what time of day it is and who installs it or who, how much glue is in there and so on so it's never totally consistent and it, it varies from guitar to guitar in manufacturers in, you know in, within a single brand and um, so it's like it is like cheese. It's really weird how this stuff goes. Anyway, so what what the what the outcome is that usually the first fret action is too high, and the primary consequence of that is how how tiring the guitar feels to play when you're playing chords down this end, or you're uh, particularly for beginners, it can be quite a disincentive. How, how when the, the first fret action is very high it can it can tire you out very quickly and then um, leave you feeling like you, you don't want to continue learning um, but more importantly when the first fret action is high it causes the actually funny enough this is almost on, so I'm going to leave that one where it is. Um, when it's high, it causes the the notes played down here to bend sharp because you're having to press so far down away from the nut, depressing the string. Like this one is quite, it's actually quite high. But um, yeah, having the, the higher it is, the, f the harder you have to press the string to to touch the fret, and as a result, um, they, the notes can go sharp and it can really upset the tuning, or it can upset a the balance of tuning in a chord, for example, and, and make it sound like a horrible mess. Um, so getting the first flat, 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 flat action right is one of the most productive and striking things you can do um, to change how your guitar plays. This is weird, this material. You get the idea, it's supposed to be a sort of free running self lubricated material but it's uh, it is like trying to cut snot or cottage cheese or some horrible horrible substance anyway so yeah so quite a lot of guitars I've seen over the time and quite a lot of people who brought guitars to me that have a first fret action that's too high and, and it, it causes the notes to go um, sharp and, and so I've, I've seen a lot like that. Um, now interestingly the, the amount um, of the actual height it has to be before that it starts creating that problem isn't that high so I'm setting a, a, a point three of a millimeter gap and actually um, your standard guitar capo with the capo on your guitar action tends to be something in the 0.1 of a millimeter you know all things being equal and a fairly low action set it tends to leave you with a first fret action of around about 0.1 of a mil 
Um, and you know, you'd be surprised to know that your guitar actually plays like that quite, quite comfortably. That's if you capo it. That's the default next fret clearance, tiny. So it can go as low as 0.1, which I avoid. I tend to compromise. I tend to go for a safe compromise with the 0.3. It seems like a conservative guesstimate. Uh, it's an improvement on what it usually is, but it's also safely within a, um, you know, the zone of not being too low. Um, and what I've noticed is that anything from about 0.5 upwards, um, and it only has to be you know, 0.5 and above, uh, your notes will start bending when you fret them down here. They'll, they'll bend sharp. So it's amazing how tiny an amount makes a big difference. So, getting this bit right, that's the wrong, that was the actual wrong, wrong gauge. I'll just widen this a little bit with this correct gauge. Um, yeah, so getting this bit right is really worth putting the energy into. Um, you know, even if you pay somebody to do it, get them to make sure they do this bit. And a lot of people don't if they don't know how important it is. I mean, good, I suppose good, quote unquote, luthiers will. Um, but the number of people I've seen who don't, who don't pay it that much attention is surprising. But it's one of those things that until you know it for yourself, you don't really know it. Um, and so there are some techs out there who you take your guitar to who've never figured out this bit of it and uh, consequently won't pay it the attention I think it deserves because it's all fiddly stuff or oh, fiddly time ok a little bit more off there and we're nearly there with this now what you find is when you get these first fret actions the way they ought to be, um, what you'll find is the actual clearance uh, between, you know, the string above the fingerboard here is very small and it's hardly, it's, it's hardly any material underneath the strings. And it looks a bit weird or feels weird, but it's what you need to have to have a nice low action. Now having done that, there's a whole bunch of this material here now that we can shave off afterwards because it's unnecessary. Um, there's no point in retaining this square nut for the sake of it. We've got loads of material sticking up here that we don't need. So I would, um, once we take strings off, I would um, file that back a little bit, smooth it out. Anyway, so that's that bit done. So now we've got the relief the way we want it. We've got the very low first fret action now, so these, these notes won't go out of tune or won't bend sharp when played. We've got very low first, sorry, last fret action, which is what I call that down there. Um, so it came up in a discussion yesterday. Somebody was asking me questions in email about action, and they were getting quite worried about this thing about the 12th. And I was quoting figures, you know, and they were saying, "What do I aim for?" And I was saying, "Well, I aim for about 1.2 on the low, sorry, the high E on the last fret, and I aim for about um, 1.5." max for the low E on the last fret and you know somebody was saying well why do you go for last fret and some people go for the 12th fret and some people go somewhere else and you know the, the point is you do what works for you and there's a kind of reasons why I use the last fret because it doesn't really make any difference whether I use the 12th or the last one I'm, I know what I'm dealing with it's a slow curve I know the curve is you know there's a wider space in the middle here I know that that action here might be a little bit higher or the same as there, um, but I don't really care about that. I just know if this is an uninterrupted free line between this pivot point down here and that one down there, then given that there's a curve sitting there, a slight curve, and I've already measured what that is, then it doesn't matter where I measure the action. It's, it's, a, it's totally immaterial. 
just think about it. This is what it is, right? Two points um, and a fingerboard which has got a certain curve in between. If I use measurement down here as a means to getting, so I, I know that a guitar that I like to play has a has a, an action of, well, let's call it 0.3. All right, there you go, 0 0.3. That's my playing action. If this was higher, if this bridge was higher, that would be greater than 0 0.3 down there. Okay, so, you know, it, what I guess I'm trying to say is you might as well use the two extremes as your marker point, knowing that you've got a curve, um, curve neck in between. So f from my perspective, it's that's why I use the last um, fret, and it's just the way I do it. And I had to say to the person calling, um, calling the person emailing, to try not to get kind of tied up or hung up on you know, the numbers anyway that people quote, you know, because if you're really hide, um, tied up on the or hung up on the numbers, then you're also going to be hung up on exactly which fret that number's measured at, and then you can get totally obsessive about it. And I pointed out, as I've done many times, that the the numbers um, are just a means to an end, and they, they have no m real kind of value or meaning in, in and of themselves. Well, they have value, but they don't have any real particular meaning. You don't chase them. So this, uh, this idea of, you know, if, if you start from a perspective that says, I've got to go with what Gibson says is the, um, you know, is the correct setting for this kind of guitar, right? And the, and all you all you know is if that's what you're doing, then you're chasing. You are being led by. It's fine by what Gibson says. Your uh, preference should be. So so you are you are going to start or set the guitar up with those specs. That's absolutely fine if you want that. But the one thing that will pretty much be guaranteed if you do go down that way of doing what Fender or Gibson or whoever tells you, you're not. Most of the time, you're not going to actually find out for yourself what difference it makes if you change um, this. So I would much more recommend that you work out what you like. And in case for me, it's what customers seem to like, which is a low, light and fast action. Generally, I don't ever get anybody asking me for anything else. So, um, you know, but if you're doing it for yourself, work out what you like because what Fender or Gibson says isn't necessarily going to suit you at all. And so even if that's the case, then, or particularly if that's the case, then you know that their numbers are only going to be a start point anyway, because you're going to, theoretically, you're going to go, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to do it until I find the, the setting I like. So my recommendation is always just treat it like a start point um, anyway and work work around it. So people say to me, what, what, you know, what um, neck relief should you have? Should you, must you have on a Fender Jaguar? And I go, I don't know. I don't really care. Um, it's not because I'm, I can't be bothered to Google it, because I can Google it like anyone else and I can waste precious minutes of my life. Um, I can tell you, for example, that in, sometimes Gibson will give, will say um, on, our, on their guitars, they'll go, uh, first fret action, 0.5 millimeters. Well, I'm not going to go for that because I've got experience of my own that tells me 0.5 can be the area where you start getting um, notes going sharp when you press them down. So why would I start with 0.5? You know, um, in this case, I go with what I've learned over time, which is safely below 0.5. Um, you know, and, and out of the uh, out of the sharp, you know, playing sharp zone, but not so low that it's like playing a capo. But you know, logic tells you that even if you went as low as that, it'll still play because it plays with a capo on, and the action when you put the capo on. At the first fret becomes incredibly low, as as you know from your own experience. And if you you know if you want to ever get, if you ever want to check your budget guitar that you've bought from a retailer that you've got out of the box, and you want to see just how ridiculously high your nut action or your first fret action might be, is kind of measure it with a pick up a, a pick or a, you know a piece of card or whatever you've got. Just just get a sense of how big that gap is. Then. Um, 
stick a capo on it, if you can get it untangled, stick a capo on it, let's say at the first fret for ease, right? And then look at your, your new first fret, that's your nut, look at the gap over your new first fret. It'll be a fraction of what this one is when you take the capo off. And why is that? Because it's just a plastic nut and nobody's cut it properly, that's why it is. But the capo tells you that your guitar can play beautifully well with the tiniest of clearances. Because this thing has its own geometry logic, right? It's a triangle, it's a neck. A baseline, well, it's curved, but it's a it's a kind of roughly a triangle baseline with a height at the bridge, a short side of the triangle, and then a long side which is the strings, right? And that will always provide some clearance. If as long as there's a triangle at all, you'll always get some clearance there. And and the capo shows you that instead of having it, it basically this turns it into a a kind of um you know four sided thing quadrilateral no I don't know you know what it a four-sided shape right this actually gives it some height at this end as well and so you're pressing downwards but what you really want is this to be as low as possible um, so that it, it it's effectively a start point a, you know a corner point in your triangle anyway um, but it isn't it's not rocket science it's more just logic and common sense really but if you start out thinking that it's all magic and only Gibson knows the answer then you know you will be I guess you'll continue to be bamboozled by it and then the danger is you'll you'll end up in an you know in forums where people are being unkind to each other and grandstanding on who knows the who knows better about the spec and you know people making you feel stupid for suggesting something else and you know that whole environment that really isn't conducive to learning um, which you, you continually find online, which is such a real shame. But um, so I would rather never say what settings I use. I just, you know, I'll say if anything, I'll just say this is what I would start with. But I totally recommend you start with something else and see how it feels to you. better but not quite there you know and, and of course the best of all it, it, it if you're new to it it's it better by far better that you start off with too much and feel the difference and then crank it to too little so it's flat and then it's even better that you crank your truss rod so that it becomes back bowed and you feel exactly what happens to your finger you know the, the touch of the guitar when you've back bowed it you know don't don't take somebody in forums word for you know somebody's label for what's going on feel it that you can't damage and you see people in forums tell you you know don't touch that don't touch your truss rod you'll do irreparable damage very difficult you'd have to be you, you could do damage to it just the same way as you could do damage to the neck by bending it so hard that it breaks you know it's not you're not likely to do that so you can you can crank your truss rod within you know pretty pretty harshly and see the effect you can certainly crank it hard enough to actually see the neck transform its shape right it's meant to do that you're meant to be able to see it back bow go flat and curve significantly and you can do it until it does all of those things without any risk of it doing any harm whatsoever but the most important thing is for you to feel the difference between each of the settings because then you'll get to a sense of why you would have one or the other and until you can feel the difference and see it and feel it and assess it with your own eyes you won't have any sense of why you might alter that and why some for some kinds of music or some styles um, a lot of relief might be good, and for others, none might be good. And, and that, the best way of doing that is to just, it's just to do it, um, and, to, and to change it and feel it. And one of the things, if, if you've, you know, if you haven't done this before, but you, you, not this particularly, but if you haven't done any adjustment of your truss rod. Um, one of the things that will really amaze you, and it continues to amaze me, is how different 
the tiniest change in the curvature, the amount of curvature of your neck produces in the way the guitar feels to play. Something one second can feel like it's almost unplayably high action. Right? And this is where often there's a common misconception. It isn't actually, you're not actually using the truss rod to adjust the action, but it does produce a higher action in the middle, obviously, by, def by you know, virtue of the fact that you're adding or taking away curve. Um, but you, you're... That's good enough. You'll get a very clear sense of how small a change in the curvature is required to translate into a big difference in feel. So, for example, the other day I finished my... Um, Les Paul style double cut homemade guitar and put it together and the first thing that happened is that I realized I'd, I'd undercut the neck angle so I had rather a tall um, uh, strings were too high and I couldn't get them low enough to meet the neck and that was a kind of just a mistake in construction really but um, I, I, so I basically sh um, filed down the underside of the bridge to gain back enough room to bring it into alignment and that was fine and, um, and, and I sort of played it at that point point. I thought god this is horrible and there was a real moment where I just thought this is it I've made a bad guitar there you go <laughs> it had to happen I hate it um, but one of the things I hadn't done unless I hadn't made any adjustment of the uh, of the um, neck profile the curvature so I lowered the bridge a little bit and then I changed the uh, neck, radi uh, neck curvature. The neck relief um, and it suddenly felt brilliant. So it's incredible how what could go from one minute feeling like oh this is a terrible <laughs> terrible guitar what's gone wrong to, yeah, actually, I quite like this. And now it's just about spot on. There's a few little things I might still tweak on it, but and I took the tremolo of the vibrato off, actually, because um, the what with not having quite enough angle in the in the neck setup, but also on top of that, the Duesenberg uh, vibrato is a weird thing. It's actually unlike a stop bar. I don't know why they did this really exactly, but the, the string launch off point is so high off the ground, I don't know if you can see that, but that's about 12 millimeters off the deck. Now a typical stop bar is a much lower, the holes where the strings exit are much lower to the, to the surface of the guitar than that. So that didn't help um, having, let me just double check this, that didn't help having already not got the angle quite right. So I was, I was short on height, and then I had this great big, um, tall, uh, too tall um, vibrato unit, which meant that when I got the bridge playing, the break angle over the bridge to the tremolo fixing point wasn't as high, wasn't anywhere near what I'd like it to be. Um, it was too too small an angle, so there wasn't a lot of downforce, extra downforce on the saddles if you like. So anyway, I, uh, for that reason I decided ultimately to take it off and I've now got a stop bar on there which makes it play very well. Um, but uh, what was I telling that story for? Um, oh yeah, just to, you know, really just to, to say how huge and profound a difference adjustments to the neck relief will be. And, you will never know how big a difference that is or how to utilize it or to put it to work for you or anyone you're setting guitars up for until you felt it yourself. And you won't feel it unless you dial it in and try it. And if you just go for what Gibson says every time in their book, you'll never know. You'll never know in person how it feels to make that tiny change. So I heartily recommend you do not get obsessed by the numbers. I've said this loads of times before, but do not obsess about the numbers. They are a means to an end, and actually any one is a decent start point. So when you're sitting there with your guitar and you think, oh God, what do I set for my clearance, my, my neck relief? I've got my 
you know, I'm, I'm holding down here and I'm measuring under there and, and I can't find it online and I don't know, ask in this forum because they're going to laugh at me. It doesn't matter, all right? Choose a, choose a millimetre, right? See what the hell that feels like, right? And then choose a tenth of a millimetre and see what that feels and plays like. And once you've had experience of the difference, you'll know what to do. And then you'll start spotting the gobbledygook of all the people who want to tell you there is just one answer, you know? And it's funny. it's one of those things, the older I get, the more I realise that, you know, I think it's a quite a, a, I don't know what the word is, a truism. Avoid those people who tell you there is one answer for everything, you know? Avoid those people who tell you there's binary answers to things like referenda and stuff like that, but hey. Yeah, experiment. You can't do it. Whoops, put that back on. You can't damage it. You have to really work hard to break a guitar's truss rod. It's made of steel, <laughs> right? I've got one in my hands here. Tell me how, by turning this a lot, I'm going to break it. I'll show you, right? I don't know how well you'll see this. Look, there's a truss rod. I don't know if you can see it. It's quite flat. I'm trying to give you a view down the side, right? You should be able to see it's quite flat and straight, right? Take the to truss rod. Hey, let's do it up really hard. Ugh. Now let's look. Look, you can even see fresh air between the bits, and I can bend it. Look. Now let's look down there. Oh my, it's bendy. It's curved. Can you see? I don't know if you can, but can you see how curved it is? And there's even a gap, and I can press it in. Right, you can see it moving. Right. I've really cranked that. Hasn't done it. Slightest bit of harm. This bit is straight. This bit can't go anywhere, it can't get any shorter, so it has to bend because I've tightened up this screw. The only thing you could do in a thousand years is to eat this, do this so hard that it shears off. Right, and you saw me straining at it there. <sighs> right, now I'm doing it backwards and that hasn't broken it off. So I'm going to now recalibrate it for this final string track. So, you know, just don't be afraid of it, you can't damage it. And you need to know how it works in practice, not in theory in somebody else's descriptions. You want to feel the difference. I promise you, you'll benefit from it. So there you go. So with that in mind, we reach the end or the last of the leveling tracks. And this is picking up some interesting high frets as I'm doing it as well and some low ones you can see the difference some of them are just not being touched at all that's cutting so none those four not being touched that one's cutting heavily that one's cutting heavily uh, that one is touching 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 so all across there different levels of unevenness um, when we're taking off the sort of top bit now I'm pretty confident that's going to play all right with that Nigh on perfect. So what we then do is we get, I wonder if I can do this left-handed, we take all the strings off. Well I can do it this way. We'll take all the strings off, we'll um, reprofile the frets so they're not flattened out and then we'll strip back the uh, back the nut a little bit. Um, funny with these tusk or this new bone or tusk stuff, even soft plastic actually is probably more likely to be, but it has a sort of it has a putty sort of look to it and it's very difficult to make it cut a tidy slot in it. Um, it, it doesn't behave in a sort of consistent way that bone does but 
it, it, the main thing is how it works, getting it accurate and the right height. There was a time I remember when people in guitar forums and whatnot um, seemed to obsess about the look of the nut. So people would, all, they'd be, all they seem to care about is um, making sure that the strings sat just above the slots and you know, certain height sticking out. It was all style over substance. And uh, without paying any attention to how high the first fret action was, it was all about you know, your, your, your nut. Oh, that's great. Your nut <laughs> is plastic. Thought as much. It's a soft plastic, <sighs> but it'll do because it works. Um, the problem with this, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was that sort of tusky stuff, but it's actually a slightly soft plastic. But I think it will do. My my principle on changing nuts is, if they work without any problem, then I go with them. <sighs> uh, I don't get all oh, uppity about having to change them. Um, I'll change them if they don't do the job. Um, but this one seems to be cut to the right depths well enough, accurately enough. Now this is now going to, I'm going to leave this for a bit because it needs to set, um, or dry is the word. So what we'll do is we'll take care of the the reprofiling part. So this means using the Stumac fret crowning tool to reshape the frets, which some of which are currently now flat on top because we've leveled them, we've taken off any excess material. And we don't want them flat on top because that will upset how they play or they'll make it less good to play. So we'll use this tool now to basically file off any the edges of any flat spots and this then returns them the frets to a kind of a nice arch shape which is how they're supposed to be um, and this is a very handy file it's paid for itself several times over um, funnily enough it's not quite as accurate as doing it manually um, but it's a lot quicker when you do loads of setups that does matter but if I was feeling nerdy then I would be once in a while I might go back and do do it by hand you know but if you don't have the sort of 70 odd quid or whatever Stumac charges for this you can certainly do the same job with a three-sided inexpensive three-sided file um, you just need time and to be observant about what you're doing. This one kind of lets you be a bit more gung-ho and also quicker, obviously. But so that's that. What I'm going to do now is just brush off some of the dust, a bit bulk of the dust if I can, and then um, I won't clean this off just yet what I'll do now is I'm going to just file back the nut. And when you're doing this you have to be extremely careful not to um, end up hitting your frets anywhere along the way. So don't attempt this if you're not confident you're controlling the file adequately. Because um, hitting hitting the frets right now with a very large rough wood file. Hey, what's that there? Interesting little gouge. Like a little, little dimple up here. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. If you if you <laughs> if you were to miss now with the with the file, then you would be. Uh, looking at a bit more fret levelling than you had anticipated. So you've got to be able to control the tool. So that's the scratchy side and here's the smoother side.
clean out the slots. Okay. something a minute. Just gonna make sure this has got the clearance it needs. Now I'm going to do something which um, is a bit annoying. I shouldn't have put that down just there because I need a little bit more play. It's a fraction to the wrong side. I'm going to use my thank you. That was not quite far enough over as it needs to be. So I'm going to go in again, this time place it there. Oh, come on hammer. Holy crap, why is that so hard? Support. Thank you. What I meant to do is reclaim that little bit of real estate on that side and then just going to round this off a fraction. Yeah, it just went in about half a millimetre too much that way, which just, it's, it's there's not a lot of leeway on where the string sits. So I wanted that to be exactly in the right place where it was to begin with and that's right nothing sticking out the wrong way so it's one of those things is best to take care of that at that point while you can now before I put any more strings on and things we're gonna well, well now I'll leave that for a minute actually what we'll do is I'll, I'll um, mask off the neck at this point now and then we'll polish out the frets and come back and um, restring once the frets are polished out. So an age time-honoured process of um, working with three different grits of paper. I, use, I personally use 600, 1000, 1500, followed by a whole set of micromesh from 1500 through to 12,000. I think it's a series of nine steps. And that is a, a nice manual kind of polishing regime. I'm sure you could do it quicker or you might even like to use a Dremel. Some people do. Some people scream absolute murder if you use a Dremel because they say it, you know, it burns the frets or heats them up too much or something, whatever. There's all kinds of reasons you figure out one thing and then somebody tells you you're an idiot for doing it that way because it's obviously going to do X, Y or Z to something or other. This is a, a low impact, shall we say, version um, using, using these different grades of paper and it's worked over the years so I just carry on doing it. Okay, so I'm going to cut some different lengths of paper and I'll see you in a bit. Just a little quick catch back up. Um, done the fret levelling, polishing and all that and as I turn the guitar over um, various things fell out so this isn't strictly necessary to stick these god that's not even that good is it wow um it's not strictly necessary but to glue these in but fr frankly you don't really want them falling out left right and center now interestingly what i want to know is where the bridge grounds out on this thing. It's not there. It's not there. Wow. Uh, curious. 
Oh, there it is there. Sorry, I didn't see it. Okay, so it does. Well, that's good. Right, so um, I think these do deserve a little bit of glue, otherwise they are likely to fall out or be pulled around, which we don't want to happen. So, before I restring, I'm going to put some glue on here, let them set, and then I'm going to take off and do some other things um, and come back and restring when that's done. But other than that, this is pretty much all set up which is good and it's funny because one thing I will say for Harley Bentons is that by and large they're not that bad when it comes to setting up they're, they're sort of compliant you know they're they're not great to begin with I mean there's a lot of leveling and fret fine-tuning to do but apart from that they're all you know they're, they're they never overrun, let's put it that way, they never, like some, the, uh, the older guitars I've worked on recently have ended up, you know, taking days at a time to do. So the Harley Bentons tend to be um, nice and straightforward, I'm pleased to say. Uh, yeah, reassuringly good. So, here we go. It's not like you can see how easy I don't even have to push them in. That one's a little bit tighter. Pardon me. That one connects with the wire. And that one sits there like that. Now it doesn't matter which way around these go. Typically people seem to like them facing forward, but actually it, it's neither here nor there as to which way they go. And this is actually a little bit, that's why it was stiff, because this is a little bit off centre. Occasionally you get that, so sometimes you have to lift the whole thing up in order to squeeze it on and then you have to kind of grind it down, get it to stay and it stiffens up as you get, see it like it's trying to pull itself out actually, <coughs> that's not good, it's off centre basically, see that, uh, well, that's why it was stiff earlier on, because it's not really quite perfectly matched but we'll I will adjust the height of this a little later okay so that's basically going to sit there on the bench now for a while um, when I do other things or while I go and do some stuff outside okay okay yeah see you in a while here we have the restrunged jazz thing and I'm going to stretch strings some more a couple I've done a couple already but I'm going to do a couple more and then we'll set about setting the intonation so this is refitted with tens I've got all the polis polystyrene polythene off all the covers off the seats kind of thing. Um, so we just need to stretch the strings and intonate now and we should be good to go. Pretty close. Um, do a couple more stretches here. We'll be ready to tune up and intonate. I'll get the um, amp on the desk for that. I probably should have just gone and got the tuner from my gigging kit.
think it's much better than before. Now I have to adjust the action a bit more. I seem to recall that I've adjusted it since taking the what's it off. Um, taking or re-gluing the bridge I should say. So just a bit over one and a half. No, go the other way. <laughs> Turn a bit down on this side. Obviously, I'll be out of tune now. Intonation. I need to reorganize this amp thing, it's just a bit not very useful being over there, or being down there and then having to plug it in and lift it up and mm, needs to be set up ready to go somewhere. It's getting on my nerves. Right, so there's our tuna fire. There's our Amp. Remove all reverby stuff, and then what do we need? Oh god! This amp in here buzzes. This, the same with the other guitar. This doesn't buzz in the other room. There's a bit of a buzz going on here, which is interesting. Um, so what am I looking for? I'm looking for a flat-headed, flat-headed screwdriver. Looking for a hard-headed woman. That was uh, what's his name, Cat Stevens. Right, Let's put this up. Play underneath the snare. Okay. <laughs> That could be a problem. Deary me. 
So, okay. Uh, so this doesn't necessarily need a Phillips screwdriver. I think it will do with the other. No, it doesn't need a flathead. But, of course, it doesn't fit under there, which is oh, infuriating. <laughs> Whoever invented them. Now, everything's running flat, so everything has to be closer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do them can actually try and take them off and move them where, wherever I need to do an adjustment because it's impossible to get to the screw and you can see it's kind of difficult to get to it without knackering the thread so this is at its limit there's no there's no further adjustment anywhere possible If we can't intonate this, then there's no room. There's no further room. Okay, so everything's going to come forward from that point, which I'm slacking everything off because I'm just not going to be able to do it with everything done up, which is an absolute pain in the what's it, but we'll do it. We'll have one chance at doing it. And I'll move everything respective, relate, no, with reference, I'm going to move everything with reference to this high E. So that was flat. So this needs to come forward, which it can do. We're out of the way of this. Put that on there. This needs to come forward a little bit. That was flat as well. Bring that forward a tiny bit. Now this one uh, needs not to be there. It needs to be there. Ah, wait a minute. Uh, this is rather stupidly got the thing back to front and then this needs to be to there and then this needs to be to there just 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 check that to so that point first front there back there how about back so that will end up being further back there it's halfway along the thing that's to the front, that's about right. Let's push that away a tiny bit more. Tunomatic nastiness. Oh, now we're going to do all this to back up left handed. hard going when it is left handed. Uh -huh.
good. Um, right, this is already leaning backwards, so your position of the bridge is already tilted back. So in a sense, these don't have to be. This is maybe a saving grace. These don't have to be all the way um, out of line. So let's try and get a straight line out of them and see if it will work. And we can't even turn them around. It doesn't even come apart. Ugh. Right, this is where this is. I, did I spoke too soon, didn't I? I said it's all nice and easy. Rush through this. Okay, so look, we've got a problem here. This is too far, too long. So all we can do is drag this forward to the point where it intonates. Okay, which is which is about here. But the problem is these are turned around the wrong way so they can't actually intonate properly we haven't got any more travel and there's no way unless I'm mistaken can we get these little things apart oh, there's a sir clip I don't know if we can get the clip out I don't think we can get the clip out I don't think we can turn it around so the best I can do is still flat say they've got this wrong. Oh gold. Right. We're gonna have to replace this bridge because it won't intonate. Um, uh, it's just an absolute pain in the ass. Well done Harley. The saddles are appears to be locked in place <coughs> so you can't do the switch around which normally you'd be able to do on a regular crap tunematic bridge um, if you struggle to reach intonation. So here it just appears to be stuck, fixed in place. Now I'll have a look and see if it is. And of course that means I have to slack everything off, which means all the strings will eventually just come undone now and they'll pop out, which will have weakened everything. So this is what I absolutely hate about badly positioned bridges crap tunematic stuff. <sighs> this is the last set of tens, new tens I had anyway. Okay, so what we have here is this this bridge where they've, I'm not going to go into it, but they've fixed these three, unless I can get these apart, which I don't see any way I can. These three are fixed facing that way and these three are fixed facing that way. Um, the bridge is on a tilt, so it's angling back anyway. Um, we need to, according to this, we need to have these things further that way, which means we'd have to switch the intonation point if we stand any chance of getting it um, to intonate. But if I just back this away again and have a look, I don't actually see any way of getting this apart unless I can wind it all the way off and pull the screw out. Let's see if, what if it happens or if it just strips the thread when we get to here. I don't really know if it's going to... will it come out? It's not going to come out, is it? It's just spinning. It's designed not really... I don't even know how they put it together at this rate, but... Yeah, it's... So uh, maybe there's some clever way. There's a little, there's a little retainer bar here, which I haven't seen before on one of these. But I don't know whether this is going to do anything. Oh, yikes! This is junk. Right. 
it's just a bar it's just a bar and what does it want to do hang on is it No, it goes down there. Logs. That's a retainer clip of some sort, but can I get it off? Gee, your guess is as good as mine. Has each one got the same thing? I think each one has its own clip. <coughs> So I've got to try and change this one round. So let's see if I can remove the clip from here. I have a feeling that's not going to be possible because it's not really designed for this. So this is very difficult to see, for let alone tweak. It doesn't really want to come undone. Push it through there. Maybe grab it with something else. Holy well, this is. I pulled a clip out, but it really, this really isn't what is meant to happen. And frankly, <clears throat> I don't think I'm going to get that clip back in there successfully, which is an absolute pisser. Sorry, but whether or not we're even going to get intonated again the other end is anyone's guess so that's that turned round now it doesn't want to go back in There's no way I'm going to get this to retain this. <clears throat> I'd be better off just buying another bridge because yeah, this I suspect this isn't going to reach intonation anyway. Um, I can't see I'm going to be able to get this back in here. So we've got to get somehow we've got to get this clip. Faintest idea how anyone put this together in the first place. No, it's not going to work. It's washed up, I'm afraid. Getting it out has bent it, so it's not going to. It's not going to work. Yeah. One and two. Sorry, this is really boring. So that goes down there, somehow over there. But we can't see where either end of this is because it isn't. It isn't actually removable without damaging us. I think this is a. It's a bit of a waste of time. Frankly, I think we're stuffed. No, I think this is screwed. That's not actually, you can't actually get to this in any useful way <clears throat> in order to put this back under load. Not even, I don't even think, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's even a pliers that will do the job. It's just, it's, sorry about this. It's not really designed to be done anything to. So we'll try and push that under and where do we go? Nowhere. And that just falls out. <laughs> mm. Uh, 
There's the hook <coughs> that's meant to clasp it. There's the Nothing is going to work on this. That's supposed to sit in there. Maybe it's the other way around, the longer way around. Switch it round, like it's going to make much difference. Put it on, sort of. Drag it to the end. Push it round. Now that, theoretically, is supposed to go into... Nope, it won't. It'll fall out. Holy crap. There's no way of retaining it and making it stay. I think I'm going to... Um, I think it's going to be worth... 15 quid's worth just to buy a new one. This is just not worth the hassle. This is not designed to be taken apart. But you don't stand a cat in hell's chance of intonating it without being able to take this apart. But I cannot lock this in place. It will not do it. I go try and go that way with this, it's going to fall off. That's in the way of that, which isn't going to work. Let's go that to that side of that. Try and push that behind there, it just falls out. Oh man. So I can't actually press that into place whilst turning it around and pushing it where it has to be. So we're saying this. Now, no no way I'm going to get to do this because <laughs> I can't make that stay there I can't hold it in place whilst pushing this has to be on the outside of that for a start which it isn't going to want to do right there's on the outside can I push that up behind there no Hold that there in place. No, it wants to move. Nope, it's all over the place. Ah, oh, for crying out loud. Try and squeeze it there again. I want that one to be underneath the thing and it won't go. Ah, oh, crap. Absolute garbage. Push that under there first. No, can I get it under there? No. <coughs> I think this is just wasting everybody's time. Right, I can't. I can't be asked for that. It's a piece of shit, <coughs> frankly. Uh, British, too mighty British. So many tunematic bridges in here, I can't even open the damn thing up. I can't believe this. What the hell? <laughs> this is just. I've got so many, I can't actually get them out because they're caught. Come on. Side of it. Bloody hell. <laughs> this is just insane. Thanks, Harley Benton. I don't know what's caught in the back of there now. Oh, bits falling out everywhere. It's caught at the back of there. Right, so the whole point of this infuriating fandango 
is that that bridge is just not going to work. This is a similar type of thing which is also sticking out telling me that it might not work as well. Yeah, so after all of that, I think you've got somewhere, and then you're downhill. So this one is a similar problem, that it's can't get this. <laughs> can't get this saddle piece back in for some reason. I have no idea why. Let's see if I can persuade it to go in. Otherwise, I'll give up with this one and move to another one. Oh, that doesn't help much, does it? Okay, that one's gone in with a bit of a push. Is that moving? This one, these are all reasonably good quality ones. Um, let's see if that one fits. Will that fit? Oh, terrific, Harley Benton. You've used your own ga diameter gauge posts. You just, I couldn't make it up. <laughs> oh, Lord. This is not funny. Right, so that doesn't work. Those are the wrong size. Let's see if a replacement pair of these will work. So basically, the, the first, the Harley, the Harley Benton bridge is either in the wrong place, so it's unintonatable, and we've also got it so it's practically impossible to take the reverse the blocks, which is usually possible with other manufacturers' bridges. Harley Benton has and chosen to use their own size as well which I think it may just get around now with this other thing but that's just but you know to, to be here doing this at this stage in the proceedings is it's just you know it's demoralizing it's just a, it's just incredibly stupid to have to be doing this to try and make the thing work um, which of these two is the, that's a clean one right. um, yeah, this will have to do for now. Now, I'm just before I even go anywhere with this, I'm sort of conscious of where we're starting from. So let me just find a screwdriver. Now, before everything was too. Um, so those are probably okay. Are they okay? Don't know. Uh, longer ones need to be longer. So that's already tilting backwards. That wasn't oh, so. These are the wrong way around too. I hate everything to do with tunematic bridges. I can promise you. In fact, this is probably the only one I can take apart easily enough. Or that one, one of these two. Right. The others are too much trouble. <clears throat> right. Keep that there for a minute. So. What we know from the original attempt to intonate is that all of these, this bridge, everything has to be this way, which is suggests that it can't be intonated at full stop. But we have to give it a go. And whichever way we use it, we need everything facing in one direction, really. <clears throat> and these always start off with everything split one way and, the, and then the other. So we have to take, whichever way we do it, we have to take three of these and turn them to face the other way to give the uh, unit as much chance as possible of intonating. So that one's turned around. I just, I really hate everything about tunematic bridges, particularly if, it, as is the case of this, they appear to be placed slightly wrong because we're not getting easy intonation. <laughs> God, I hate them. I think I've got 
think I've said it a few times before. I should have known. You know, here's me going, oh, it's going to be easy. Nice to have an easy. Everything about the fretwork was relatively easy. It's just this stupid bridge. There's no point. If you can't intonate it, it will not sound good. It'll play slightly out of tune everywhere <clears throat> further up the neck. And that, what you saw just before with me playing the notes, the harmonic and then fretting it, was telling us very clearly that it's not intonating. <clears throat> and that is a purely a measure of distance. It's, it's nothing else involved, just distance. So what it's telling us is that that, for the bass strings, they were ringing low, but we had no further adjustment available. So it's telling us that it was ringing flat, sorry, it was fretting flat. So what it was telling us is that the, the um, saddle point was still too far away from the nut, and there was no other alteration we could make to bring it closer, because we'd run out of adjustment. So what I'm trying, what you're forced to have to try and do is to try and regain some of that adjustment by switching the saddles around like I'm doing here, which isn't possible on the Harley Benton one without somehow damaging the little sp spring clip. I couldn't get the clip out without it distorting and then I couldn't certainly couldn't get it back on even if I had got it off. So nothing was really very likely with that one. <clears throat> okay, so now we have all of them pointing in the same direction. Now, I need all of them far forward, certainly for the bass strings, as far forward as it will go. Um, and actually, we probably barely need any offset here because this thing is, that is actually already set at a slight tilt. So I will give it the smallest amount of stagger. And then the front one so the uh, thin strings that I'm on now will have a separate three-way stagger, but it will be minor as well. So everything will appear to be fairly close to the front edge. <clears throat> like, kind of like that. Let's see, we're on base. That's going to be, that one's be longest. Short, oh, it's confusing there. So that's going to be... That's got to be longest, but it's still too, my god. That's going to, by definition, yikes, this is mad. It's got to come this way. <laughs> what the hell's going on? Right, so we need, uh, we need longer, 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 short, short, shorter, but we already know that one's too. This isn't going to work. This is really depressing. We already know that up against the stops on the bass string is too long, and there's there's nowhere we can go with that. These should get shorter after that, so we have to have them. They really all have to be rammed up against the edge, and then we have to hope that the slant of the bridge itself does the rest, because I don't think it needs any further adjustment. At least don't even sit exactly right. So we had it all at the front there, and then we were counting on the tilt backwards there. We would expect that one followed there. Longest. Blimey. We would expect that one forward and back. It's not good. I do not. I do not like this at all. Now I'm going to put this. If I can get it onto there. Thank you. And I'm going to do one string at a time just now. Oh, I forgot the bleeding clip. Oh. <sighs> Tell you something. I hate tunematic bridges for this reason. There's so little intonation reach to them. I mean, there's supposedly a bit more on that one, but if that one doesn't work, then we're, we're, we're in trouble. And the only alternative is to try and find one with a longer reach, which I mean, you're starting to look at 
kind of bespoke <coughs> bridges, gotos and things like that. I have had bought a couple in my time that do have a longer reach for the intonation. See this doesn't even want to go in. It's it's hellishly uncooperative. Right. All the while now this is stressing the strings so that before too long it won't be really ideal to play the strings. I'll try a couple. So now they're coming out oh god. Now they've come out of there, which now is uncoiled. And we have to go in there again, try and... Oh, they're popping out now. I stinking well hate tunematic bridges. I really do. Now we'll try and get this back on. <clears throat> get on there. This bridge is holy shite. There's nothing we can do. There's no further adjustment room available. I think um, I'm going to have another go with this one just to confirm what I think I already know. But if this A is the same, and we can see that we we have got no further adjustment. We've got no further room for adjustment. These stops are as far forward on the bridge as possible as they were on the other bridge. Fun, but it's it's the it's co it's cost me this time now. So you, it's not great. Just on. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it all up with this bridge on, but this is close. I mean, for the money, the amount of hassle sending it back after having spent all this time fret leveling it um, is quite some issue, really. And you know, that's a hundred. 
could of my time would have been wasted. turn three of the things round which I couldn't do on that one without the thing breaking or coming apart or bending I should say um, then having turned the three blocks round I've had to shove them all up against the uh, stops just it's a bit flat but I can't go anywhere with it I'm afraid show you a close up with oh, let's get the magic eye to come down hey we don't have to lift the guitar up there you go magic eye fans magic arm fans da, 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 da. you ever seen one like that before they're not often everything everything against the stops um, you'll notice that it's actually by default it's slightly tilted anyway which is doing the job of the small amount of intonation it needs mostly the job um, but thankfully with it's only just working with everything there's no you know so to me that bridge is slightly misplaced um i don't know whether they intended it to be tilted but thankfully it is because it's just about by chance allowed us to get away with it but that could have been an, a happy accident um but we wouldn't have got there with the original bridge because there was no way of switching this these are things around i'm going to put these in a in a bag with some uh, with the um, what other bits will go oh um Yes, these little bits here, the original nubbins. So uh, you can have that bridge for nothing because it's no use to me. Um, as you can see, sitting there. And you can also have this back. This, if you want to send back the Harley Benton and say what a load of garbage that is. But anyway, we got it intonated. That's, that's the important thing. Um, but it's odd looking. That's just. You know, basically we've we've got we've got a bridge that's that's just about in the right place this direction and it's just tilted back slightly. I kind of would have expected to see a bit more of a tilt, you know, in the staggering patterns. But the point is 
we started off with this one at its max. We couldn't quite intonate that one, or just about intonated, which means everything else should technically step forward from there in two sets of three. So that one, this one forward of that one, that one forward of this one, this one back close to where that one is. But we, we don't seem to have any leeway in there. It's all in a line straight, ready to go. Anyway, apart from that, it's great. Um, I might even edit out some of my frustrations and screamings and rantings. Then again, I might actually not because it's real life and editing takes too much time, quite frankly. Anyway, the good news is I suppose that I got where I needed to go without too much more adjusting things and stressing the strings. So these are going to be good to go. All right. Well, there you saw it. I hate pneumatic bridges. All right.